Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 11 of my KSP campaign, where you see me time warping to the completion of my next tech node. Now, the completion of research on electrics not only locks, unlocks solar panels and some better batteries, but most importantly, the Provo Dobodyne um, probe core, which will allow me to have SAS on my unmanned vehicles. So, um, what I first thing I did with this was to redesign and build Muna One, which you might recall from a couple of episodes ago, I have plans to impact the moon with. I spent a lot of time a couple of episodes going over the design of this thing, so I'm not going to spend any time talking about that now. And then with that done, I went right into building a second unmanned craft. Um, this is going to be MapSat 1, a mapping satellite that I want to put into a polar orbit around Kerbin of 250 uh, kilometers. Mapping satellites you want to put into a polar orbit. This will allow uh, uh, it to go over all of the landmass of the body that it's orbiting. Because as it's going over a polar orbit and the uh, planet is rotating underneath that orbit, it will uh, end up going over every part of the surface. So definitely if you're going to do mapping satellites with uh, mods like ScanSat, Polar orbits are the way to go. Now, I want to get it up to 250 kilometers. That requires an extra 240 meters per second of delta V. That's on top of the 3,700 meters per second of delta V that I like to um, that I like to budget for my launches. So that gives me 3,940 meters per second of delta V that I require. But going into a polar orbit is more expensive than going into a simple equatorial prograde orbit, which is what you've been seeing me do for the most part when I manage to successfully get my orbits, that is. Um, so uh, I'm going to budget an extra few hundred meters per second uh, to get into uh, a polar orbit. And as well, I'm going to put on an extra little bit of um, delta V because once again, I'll be going up by hand. Uh, I'm going to be going on a little bit of a steeper ascent. Again, communication being the issue behind that. So overall, I ended up with a vessel with 4,464 meters per second of delta V. Uh, yeah, that, sh that should work for me. So we'll stick this guy as well into the building queue. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about mapping satellites and polar orbits and all of that kind of stuff when we actually get to doing this mission. And then we come to the Curse Stock 4, once again ferrying a couple of tourists up into a uh, suborbital trajectory. This time it's Svetlana escorting Roberta and Harlong. And uh, you've seen this vessel before. You've seen actually this exact same mission type before at the conclusion of the last episode. So I'm not going to spend too much time with it or really much of any time at all other than to let you know that the entire mission went without a hitch and we got these guys back down to the surface. After that, it was a, a few days time warp to the unlocking of the aerodynamics tech node. And uh, with this unlocked, I set myself to building a vessel, an airplane, sorry, a jet plane that I could get myself up to over 20 kilometers of altitude. Um, there are a number of these curb and survey missions that keep coming up that require getting to these kinds of altitudes. So this is a purpose-built craft that I'm not going to show you because I'm actually pretty, pretty happy with the design. I think it's a little bit unique and uh, I don't want to spoil anything and you'll get to see this um, when I end up using it to do a mission, which unfortunately will not be in this episode. Instead, we're going to move on to the Kirkery 4, which has had a couple of additions since the last time you saw it. Uh, it's got these launch clamps on it now. I've had these unlocked for a little while, but this is the first time I've actually uh, been able to spare the part counts in order to put them on. And I've also put on some uh, science on this guy. I'm hoping to collect a bit of science. This is, again, of course, another tourist contract, though it is a little bit of a different one. This is uh, one of these mega contracts where there's not only uh, some people to ferry around suborbitally, some of them want to go and do orbits, some of them want to do flybys by the moon and by Minmus. So I'll be working on this one for a while. And to be honest, I think I'm going to try and phase myself out of doing these tourist contracts because I need to do stuff that's just going to make a little bit more cash. I want to get that cash flow going and start upgrading my KSC. 
Whoa, what the heck just happened? What just broke off there? What, what, something just broke off. Everything seems to be still flying fine. I, I have no idea what that is. There's a little chunk of debris down there falling away. It just came off of the rocket. What? The, there it goes again. I have no idea what's going on. There's debris down there just falling off of this rocket, but I don't... Well, that's really weird. I, I, I don't understand that. Like, I, I'm looking around. I don't see anything that's... Oh, wait. Okay, well, I do have some science to do. We'll worry about this later. So we'll open up the materials bay. This will be my first upper atmosphere materials bay. I also get an upper atmosphere goo canister. Um, remember that uh, I actually have gotten that stuff from space. Oh, wait! It's a launch clamp. I'm being stopped by a launch clamp. Oh, that's weird. Obviously some sort of weird glitch going on there. Well, it doesn't seem to be impeding anything, so <laughs> I think I'll just carry on normally with this mission. I was so distracted by that that I actually didn't realize that my apoapsis had gone way back, way past my target of 75 kilometers and I've just run out of fuel. Um, and we're going to be going up to an apoapsis of about 117 kilometers. Anyway, as far as the science goes, actually, you probably noticed it wasn't a goo that I got there. It was a temperature scan that I got there. And I have the thermometer and the goo canister in this little service bay. Um, I'd already gotten a... Uh, a uh, materials bay in space in the past, so um, I, I hadn't. I, that's why I thought I'd, gra I'd grab the uh, upper atmosphere one. But anyway, this is going to necessitate Valentina going out there and collecting the uh, the science. This is because the science is attached to the ascent stage and will be discarded uh, on re-entry. Um, that's probably going to be a good thing because uh, I'm going to be falling from a little bit of a higher altitude than I planned, so I'm glad I'm just going to be going in with just the capsules and nothing else attached to it. Uh, yeah, so she's going around collecting the science, um, opening and collecting the science from the thermometer allowed the thermometer to be used once again to be able to pick up a temperature scan from space near Kerbin, which of course had to be collected once again through EVAs, and then it was time to... Uh, for re-entry, which uh, admittedly uh, did end up getting a little hot <laughs> thanks to the uh, higher altitude than anticipated uh, that we were dropping down from. We ended up maxing out at about 12 G, so the tourists might have gotten a little bit more than what they were bargaining for, but uh, everything came out okay, uh, and uh, yeah, we recovered the vessel motor. And with that mission completed, I thought I'd get into building my first of four communication satellites. The, the mission plan here is to have four of these things and to place them in roughly as, as close to circular as I can get, equ equatorial orbits with an altitude of 1,067.5 kilometers. And they're all gonna be spaced equidistant from each other. And I'll get into why uh, that specific altitude uh, on actual launch day. I'll talk about it then, it'll make more sense. Um, but at that altitude, four satellites will be able to communicate with each other just through the communitron antennas, and they'll also be able to communicate with anything on Kerbin's surface and anything in space around Kerbin up to an altitude of about a thousand kilometers. So this will serve as a communication network, especially for my unmanned probes. And I'm also going to be putting on these, um, dish antennas that will, uh, be able to communicate out towards the moon and to communicate out towards Minmus. So this will greatly enhance my ability to send unmanned crafts around. Now, I'll talk about, you know, the actual mission plan in more detail on actual launch day. And I'll also talk about, um, you know, the Delta V requirements and all of that kind of stuff. But I want to talk about something a little different first. I want to talk about electricity. Because these antennas do take power, as does the probe core, and I want to make sure that this thing can survive the night just on its battery power. So, at an altitude of about 1,067 kilometers around Kerbin in a circular orbit, this thing will spend about 800 seconds at in the night. Um, and you can... Uh, there are some formulas you can look up to, to calculate that kind of stuff, or if somebody wants me to go over that in more detail uh, in some future episode, I certainly can do that. But uh, 800 seconds is what this thing needs to survive. And then what you want to do is you want to sum up all the stuff that takes up electricity 
on your vessel. That's the probe core and most importantly, those antennas. And for this particular craft, that sums up to 1.8 kilowatts, or if you like, 1.8 kilojoules per second. And if you multiply that by, excuse me, the 800 seconds, that comes out to be a little bit over 1,400 kilojoules of electricity that this thing will consume over the night. So you want to put batteries on there to uh, mitigate that. Now, these, uh, these circular batteries that we see on here each are 200. So ideally, I'd love to have eight. But unfortunately, part count, count limitations will force me to uh, take off two of these batteries. So technically, it won't have enough battery power to survive the night. That's unfortunate, but you know what? <laughs> the thing is, it's going to work anyway because uh, Kerbal Space Program doesn't monitor electrical consumption or generation when the vehicle is not the target vehicle. So, um, although it's kind of unfortunate, I kind of wanted to have that moral victory of knowing that it can survive the night, you know, for real, um, even when it is the target vehicle, I ended up having to kind of abandon that idea until I upgrade the vehicle assembly building. I'm still going to run into these part count limitations, so... Uh, yeah, it is what it is. Anyway, uh, this also gave me an opportunity to start playing around with the fairings, which I have unlocked recently. So this is my first playing around uh, with the the new stock fairings. You can see I'm kind of struggling with them a little bit, but eventually I do end up figuring them out. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if I really like the look of these. I got really used to the fairings that are packed with... Uh, KW Rocketry. KW Rocketry has beautiful fairings and they look really, really nice. And uh, I don't know, I, I just find these things are, they look a little kind of blocky to me. But you know, they are what they are. You got to protect your payload. So uh, I'm very glad that uh, at least KSP does have stock fairings now. So I, I'll still stick with these uh, for the foreseeable future. For now, though, I think it's time to leave ComSat 1 and move on to the main event. That being the launch of Muna 1. Now, the plan here with Muna 1 is to impact the moon. And uh, on board I have an ant engine. And on the way down, I am to test the ant engine above, oh, I thought it was something like 10 to 20 kilometers or something like that. And I did a little bit of playing around in simulation mode and found that if I launched with my launch site about, oh, about a third... No, a sixth of a rotation, a sixth of a complete circle behind the moon. You know, so that would be an angle of about 60 degrees behind the moon. And I did a little bit steeper than normal trajectory. Remember, I do have to think about remote tech. I do have to think about keeping contact with mission control and keeping that line of sight going. So I found if I, I need to go in a steeper trajectory, but not too steep of a trajectory. So a little bit of a steeper trajectory. I did a little bit of practicing and I found out that this particular sort of uh, alignment when I started out, about 60 degrees behind where the moon is, seemed to work pretty well. And that ended up putting um, my apoapsis about 60 degrees ahead of the moon. And then it takes about a day for the probe to get out there. And the moon does a complete rotation in about six days. So, you know, in, in that single day, we'll do a sixth of a rotation. And then it would end up being around where my apoapsis is by the time I got out there. And that seemed to work fairly well. The other thing I want to do is do some balancing using TAC Fuel Balancer. I want to drain the fuel out of the bottom tank first, that's the largest tank that's on this thing, and then I will balance the fuel consumption across the other uh, three tanks that make up the first stage of this particular rocket. And again, this is all about keeping that center of mass forward, keeping that center of mass up high on the rocket above the center of lift, because if the center of mass ends up coming close to the center of lift, and especially if it drifts behind it, the craft will become aerodynamically unstable. All right, we are ready to go. Lift off. Now I found on my particular ascent what, what seemed to work well is if I was aiming to hit a pitch of about 45 degrees at an altitude of 15 kilometers. That's a little steeper than normal. Um, normally you want to hit 45 degrees at about 10 kilometers, but again, this is about staying above mission control as as long as I can so that I can re 
ping my communication link. The other thing I was finding out was that if I enabled um, the parachutes before leaving the atmosphere, uh, that seemed to have better luck with, with them actually deploying and being able to recover the stage. So um, I'm using the real shoot window here to set the parameters I want for those parachutes. And then I will enable them before uh, I am out of the atmosphere. Once I'm up at a higher atmosphere, then I know they won't deploy if I do enable them. And now I'm seriously, oh god, I, I'm way, I'm not steep enough. Not even close. I've spent too much time fiddling around with parachute. Shoot. As I said, I wanted to be at about a pitch of 45 degrees at an altitude of about 15 kilometers, and I'm just at 15 kilometers right now, and at a pitch of, I don't know, maybe 75 degrees. Well, that's not cool. I got a pitch over. Ah, shoot. Oh, well. I got what I got now. I got to make this work. Come on, pitch over, you little wiener. The whole rocket's flying well. It's very stable. I just wish I was at a bit of a, a higher pitch right now. I think it's a lower pitch. Okay, Apoapsis is climbing lightly, uh, nicely. Apoapsis just over 150 kilometers. Arm the parachutes, getting ready to get rid of that first stage. I gotta find the communic or the dish antenna, or else I won't have any communication with this upper stage. Where is that antenna? Oh, there it is. Okay, so I gotta activate that. A lot of shaking going on. Oh, and I just ran out of fuel. Okay, point that at mission control. Attach the lower stage. And engage the next engine. And there we go. We're off. Still, uh, I'm not even down to a pitch of 40. My, my prograde vector is not even down to a pitch of 45 degrees. How am I aiming? I am aiming, oh boy, let's look at this again. Oh, I gotta bring that apoapsis way, way to the east. All right, you take a look at my nav ball, you can see now I am pointing pretty much down to a pitch of about five degrees. And that's not very efficient as far as raising my apoapsis goes, but it's all about getting that apoapsis to go further to the east, to get further ahead of the moon. Or else I'm running a danger of just missing the moon altogether. So I'll keep that pitch right down at zero. And I'm going to keep thrusting until my apoapsis height hits about 12 kilometers because that is the alt or 12,000 kilometers because that is the altitude of the moon. Okay, reducing thrust. and 12 kilometers reached. And that's 12,000 kilometers once again, of course, not 12 kilometers. So we will deploy these solar panels. These solar panels, by the way, come from homegrown rockets, uh, a mod that you've been seeing quite a bit of. Uh, they are deployable solar panels, but they uh, are static solar panels. And by that, I mean they do not rotate to maximize the amount of solar radiation you're receiving. You see, they're not rotating right here. So what you have to do is you have to rotate the craft itself. So they're kind of similar to the static, stock static solar panels that come, except for the fact that you can deploy them like this. I really like them. Uh, what's especially nice right now, of course, is that they are just two parts, <laughs> and they are producing a lot more than the equivalent amount of static solar panels. And they look good, too. I think this thing looks, especially once you deploy these little antennas that come with it, uh, I think this thing looks rather badass. I'm sort of testing to see if there's any kind of compatibility with remote tech, and there's not. You can see when I close that dish antenna, um... I did lose my connection up there at the top left. So those little antennas don't work with remote tech. So that's that's a little bit unfortunate, but they do look cool. Oh, and I got a temperature scan. So I'm able to do that temperature scan high above Kerbin. Transmit that. Checking my electricity, making sure that doesn't get too low. Nowhere close to being low. And I'll do another look at the thermometer. Sometimes you can squeeze out just a little bit more science. So we'll log. No, there's nothing to transmit. So no more, no more temperature science to transmit. And I'm looking at this. Yeah, it's looking okay. There's nothing left to do but the time warp out there. And hopefully I will encounter the moon. You can see that yellow line 
Well, there's my uh, first stage. It's going to, it's suborbital. It's going to crash back into Kerbin. Hopefully the parachutes will save it. You can see the yellow line um, connecting back to mission control. That's my communication link. Time warp out. The debris is now gone. That first stage disappeared. Let's check. Uh-oh. Stage destroyed. Well, that's not good. What happened? It burned up in the atmosphere, and it was valued. Oh, it's nice that it tells you what you lost. It was valued at $9,000, and it's gone. It had enough parachutes, but the problem is it was going too fast and burned up. Okay, that's actually fair enough. It was coming in at a pretty steep trajectory. So next time I do something like this, I won't put parachutes on it. Okay, actually, this is looking all right. It's still another uh, six hours to Apoapsis. So hopefully Kerbin will spin all the way around as I go by here. I am definitely going to encounter the moon, and there we go. Ooh, except, shoot, I shouldn't have pushed my Apoapsis as high as I did. If you notice, the Apoapsis was actually beyond the moon's orbit. It was actually 600 kilometers beyond the moon's orbit, and that's because the 12,000 kilometer altitude of the moon's orbit is measured from Kerbin's center, and Kerbin has a radius of 600 kilometers, so yeah, that's so it's went a little bit beyond. So that's not so good because I, if you look at the red dot, you will see it is way over to the west of Kerbin, and it's going to be a few hours before it comes around. Well, I can do another temperature scan. Let's transmit that. Wait a minute, how can I transmit? I have no. Oh. Oh, just use the antennas that were on the solar panels. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, ignore that. Ignore that. That was a mistake on my part. Oh, I did get a moon flyby contract, so it's not completely useless. I am doing a moon flyby, and I got a moon flyby contract. Yeah, so it used the antennas that was on the panels, which don't work with remote tech. So as far as they're concerned, I do have a connection, which I don't. Oh, and I am not going to get a connection before I am free of the moon. Well, this could have gone worse. I mean, I could have been on a collision course with the moon without a connection, in which case I could only helplessly watch as I crashed into the moon uh, without being able to test the ant engine on the way down. So there's that. And looking at this orbit, my periapsis is well out of Kerbin's atmosphere. And my orbit still crosses the moon's orbit. So uh, this will encounter the moon again. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have to keep an eye on it. And uh, I hopefully will be able to encounter the moon again at a time that I have a connection. And at which time I still got what? I still got 211 meters per second of delta V. Not enough to get an orbit around the moon, but certainly enough, I think, to be able to affect my trajectory to uh, collide with the moon. Oh, launch pad reconditioning, com reconditioning complete as I'm doing my time warping. So we'll keep time warping. Yeah, the moon's getting away on me. I got my connection back. Of course, there's not much to do right now. And we'll time warp around and see if I can get another connection. Oh, an alert came up. What's that one? Uh, oh, a, a MAPSAT 1 is now complete. Okay, you know what? I'm thinking I might be better. Let's look at the, at the VA. Oh, there's only one thing being built in the VAB. So that I have two uh, bays that are capable of doing construction. So I think I would be better served going back to the Kerbal Space Center and getting something else into the building queue. So we will leave MAPSAT 1 for now and see if we can not get something else building. But I thought before I doing that, I might as well pick up another contract to replace the one I just finished off. And the one that caught my eye is this Rescue Tamley Kerman from Orbit Around Kerbin. Uh, I'd love to pick up another. This is nice because you get a, uh, a another Kerbinot for free, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it actually costs me money to get Kerbinots. It's something close to a hundred thousand Kerb bucks for it. So yeah, I'll do this one. Pick her up. She has somehow got herself stuck into this orbit, way out past the moon's orbit. I don't know how she got herself out here. Obviously, some rival space program that's doing better than me. But nevertheless, 
It's now up to me to rescue her. And the advance that I got from this particular contract gave me enough money to finally start the process of upgrading my vehicle assembly building, which is going to be great because now I will no longer be limited to just 30 parts. So, and I'll also have uh, the basic action groups unlocked. So that will be excellent. But all of that is going to have to be for a future episode. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.